Well, good morning on the Pacific Coast. Good afternoon to those of you throughout the country. My son yesterday, Jackson, after playing golf, wanted to learn about Pearl Harbor. So we watched the movie. He has a full understanding of it now. So I would like to say good morning to those of you in Hawaii. Hopefully my family will be there soon and we have clients there. So good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Welcome to Ignite Method. This is module two, taking the leap. And today we're gonna be talking about kind of the startup phase of your business and some of the things you need to do to get the business set up. Quick workshop primer as we always do, just to let you know and remind you, if a question comes to your mind, please jot it down in Q&A or write it down. Q&A is only visible to me, so if you want the question to come from you to me without anyone else seeing it, I will not read your name when I read the question. You can use Q&A. I prefer Q&A regardless. When you chat, I can see you. Everyone else can see you. I believe you can choose chatting between you and me. I know that I can. Um, Right now, I'm all panelists and attendees. Do you see a drop down for you folks? Is there a drop down, Angela, for panelists and attendees, or is it just all or nothing? No drop down. Okay, so only I can do that. So I'm on panelists and attendees, and you should all be able to see this. Okay, so chat is visible to everyone. Everyone can see it, so be careful of that if you don't want to put something there. And if you need any further clarification, stop me. Ask me a question. There are no dumb questions. Sometimes things don't process well for people, and you need to kind of take your time and understand it. It's okay. It's going to benefit everybody. So my name is Eric Greenspan. I'm a dad. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm unemployable. I love marketing. Uh, I am the CEO of a company called Astutomy, which runs schoolofbookkeeping.com. I also run 74 Systems, the Ignite program, Ignite Method, and 74 Web. We now offer awesome hosting services. Pretty cool. We have a lot of fun. And my partner in crime, business, and life is Angela Rust, and she is here with me as well. If you want to learn more about me, you can go to ericgreenspan.com. So I ask you, are you achieving all of your goals? Do you have enough good clients? Are you making enough money and are you having fun? Today we'll focus on just one of the bullets and that's, are you making enough money? I know there's at least one of you on right now, more than one, that would like to increase their income. In fact, I think everybody would like to do that. We wanna work less and make more. <clears throat> So if we're going to do that, we need to take steps to automate. We need to get smarter. The more skills we have, the better we can serve our clients and the higher the price we can charge. We need more customers. If you simply don't have enough customers, then we need more. If you have enough and you just need more money, we're going to talk about that throughout Ignite Method. But just think about making more money. There's no shame in making more money. It's a good thing for all. If you make a ton of money, I've got plenty of charities that you can donate it to. So that's going to be our kind of our bullet point that we'll focus on throughout today. And always, do you do what you love? Can I get a set of hands, please, for those of you that do what you love? Fabulous. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. I will lower your hands for you. I'm going to start off by sharing with you a quick manifesto that I wrote. This was something I wrote after realizing that when I attended TED, they had put the Holstein Manifesto, and you can Google that, H-O-L-S-T-E-E, -E, Holstein Manifesto. They had put it in a sleeve of a, a tube rolled up, a poster, if you will, inside my TED swag bag from 2010, I think it was. And I didn't even realize it was there for about a year. And I opened it up and realized what it was and read it. And it kind of changed my life. And you can read it. I have it at 74 Systems. But then I decided that I needed to write my own. And mine's a little bit different. I'm going to read it to you. And it's 
Woo, takes a lot, so bear with me. And off we go. Unless you are living on a beach, drinking out of coconuts, your kid's college is prepaid, including price increases for the next 10 years. You upgrade when you fly and your hotel room always has the best ocean view. You have the safest and most environmentally sound vehicle available. You sleep like a baby. You eat only farm grown organic food and you never look at the prices. You are healthy and you have plenty of time to exercise. You can afford the finest healthcare and if needed, you can be with your loved ones in their time of need. You spend an inordinate amount of time with your spouse and kids and you visit your parents more than they expect. You have everything you need and most of what you want. You are truly happy and satisfied with your life's achievements. You spend a tremendous amount of time and money on helping others and solving big and local, big local and world problems. You absolutely adore your family, you love and respect yourself, and your biggest frustration is that you wish you had more years to live to do more towards leaving the world a better place than you found it, then no, you are not doing enough. And that is the answer to the question as, as it started. If you remember, I said, let's, let's go back to that. <clears throat> Unless you are doing all of these things or living this life. Now, this is utopia. I'm not gonna kid you. None of us are gonna get that. But come on, folks, if you can't afford healthcare or to be able to be with your family when they need you because you have to work and you're not making enough money, we need to fix that. Those are the kinds of things that justify working harder and making more money. The Greenspan Manifesto is available at 74 Systems. You can check it out there. Just scroll down to the very bottom of the page and you can click on it and read more. Today is Ignite Method Module 2, Taking the Leap. We're going to jump into creating our business and we're gonna jump right in right now with our agenda. We're gonna first talk about formation, the entity type that you may use. Are trademarks important? We're gonna talk about that. I've got my own opinions and I'm not gonna give you legal advice, but I'm sure gonna give you my opinions from my experience. And then of course, the mighty old URL, your domain name. Determining a platform, we're gonna talk about that. I'll explain that when we get to it. Building and rebuilding a website, how important is it? Building and enhancing social media, hmm. Not all great at that, are we? Finding a location, working from home, we're gonna discuss the benefits of each. The right tools, these are the big ones. And then we'll focus on the apps because today the cloud has changed the way we live and breathe and run our businesses. So let's start off with formation, trademarks, and URLs. And I'll bring up the four top ones. And I'll talk about these with you openly because I just wanna make sure you understand how and why you might choose one. And, and, and really, and I, I won't go into why one is better for tax purposes or legal purposes, but what I will tell you is this, a sole proprietor versus the rest. Even if you're an LLC and a disregarded entity because there's only one member and you meet all the requirements and what have you, whatever state you're in and whatever the issues, having some sort of an entity versus not is obviously going to be beneficial to you. I've been sued. In some cases, the corporation saved me big time. Um, I can tell you right now, there were a number of issues where I personally guaranteed loans in a business that failed and that didn't go well. But when it came to the company itself, I was 100% protected, and that certainly was welcomed. Uh, in shutting down a company or transferring a company, having structure and shares or member units, in, in the case of the LLC, makes it a lot easier for you to raise capital or bring in a partner or incent employees. We had a big, 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 uh, sharing program with our employees. And one of the things, and this is very, very important, okay, this is the crux that applies to your industry. One of the things that I've often spoken about in Ignite one-on-one -on -one is that everybody in the organization should be selling. I don't care if you're paying somebody minimum wage, they should be bringing business to the table. In turn, they should be recognized as having some sort of ownership 
to some degree. It could be very minuscule or it could be sizable. And that's what the, uh, the LLC or the, the corporation structures will allow you to do with shares. You know, it's funny, when I first started my first corporation, I, I was told I had to start, I should start with 10 million shares, which is totally arbitrary. Could have been 10 shares. You know, there are companies out there, uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, for example, is, is, you know, has fewer shares at a very high price. That's just the way he rolls. I guess he can do whatever he wants. Uh, he can because he writes his own ticket, makes his own rules to a certain degree. But you can do it however you want. Google kind of has that same mentality. I think Apple's moving in that direction. Higher price, fewer shares. And as you grow, you do buybacks. But we're not talking about that here. We're talking about just incenting employees and making them a part of what you do day in and day out. And this is a great way to do that because if everybody in your organization was responsible to do what I'm talking to you about in Ignite or here, they should all be on this presentation for that matter. And if they're in the room, invite them over. Because at the end of the day, an employee or somebody within your organization, a partner, whoever that is, if they brought in the business like you do, you double your revenues instantly. So you need to talk to them about that process. You need to talk to them about how their responsibility is when they're at a Starbucks, just like you are, and you walk in and you're wearing your Ohio State Buckeyes t-shirt in a Michigan Starbucks, which I often joke about because I'm a Buckeye and we have this huge battle between Wolverines and Buckeyes. But when you walk into a Wolverine Starbucks in a Buckeyes red shirt, you're actually gonna make friends. You've got something in common. I talk about your body as a billboard and that's what I mean. Well, why shouldn't your employees be thinking that? Well, most of it is because you've never really told them they should. Even your wife or your husband or your significant other or your neighbor or your friend or your family, everybody should be reminded, hey, feel free to send me a referral. Feel free to send me some business. If you're a bookkeeping professional, the CPA that referred you your last deal, what was the last time you picked up the phone and called that person? It's putting this thought in people's minds that's going to bring you more business. If every one of you got on the phone today and called and thanked the last person who sent you a referral, one of you would get another referral before the day's end. I can practically guarantee that will happen. That's how it works. You know the, the expression, the squeaky wheel gets the oil? Well, if you don't want to be squeaky, you don't want to be that realtor that sits down at the bar and says, hi, what's your name? Can I have your listing? You got to date a little bit before you have children, okay? And, and that all goes to it. So what I'm trying to share with you is while the entity is important for protection, because that's important as well, and you can get an LLC through our, our friends at CorpNet or your choice that can get you up and running very quickly, or you can remain a sole proprietor and take the risk, you should probably consider the former. Now, that's great. And that's where it ends for me, okay? You can talk to your friends and your CPAs and yourself about whether you're gonna be an LLC and file as an S Corp or, or be a C Corp or whatever the heck you're gonna be at the end of the day. But I want you to think about it from a sales perspective because that's what we're here. We're a marketing company and we're helping you grow your business. How you can use the member units or the shares in your company as a way to incent. And let me give you a perfect example. If you have, let's say, a million shares, let, let's, let's make it simple. Let's say you have uh, 100 shares when you form your LLC, 100 member units, they're called. If you partner with somebody, you can give them 49 and keep 51 so you have control. Now, if you give somebody 49 of your 100 member units, that person ought to be bringing in business, not just producing. Now, if your deal is that you do all the selling and this person does all the production, that may be different, but there's no reason why in a pinch you can't jump in and help with production and that person shouldn't be talking to the Wolverines at the Ohio State Buckeyes Starbucks. Everybody should be selling. 
Now, if you just want to give one share of that hundred to one of your staff members or an employee, or maybe even not give away shares, you can skip this entire discussion and just give them a spiff or a bonus. If everybody in your organization knew that they would benefit either by ownership or cash by bringing in more business, they would bring in more business. That's enough on that topic. All right, let's talk about trademarks. Now, it's funny because, first of all, if, if you ever see <clears throat> the marks on somebody's um, page, there are a variety of ways that people do this. And, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to break here. I'm going to bring up a browser and I'm going to take you to USPTO. Dot gov, which is where all this happens. And you can learn a lot about this and you can do this yourself or you can do this through somebody like a CorpNet. So, and I actually, I wrote an article. Let's see if we can find it. TM versus R. Eric Greenspan. Let's see if we can find that article. That's the other Eric Greenspan. Osteoporosis. Ooh. Okay. Well, in any event, so let's talk about the differences. And it, it's important for you to understand that you can add a mark to your claim, whatever it might be, by simply adding a TM. Now, there's two ways, and again, this is not legal advice, it's just experience that I've had. There's two ways to protect something. One is by starting it and keeping record. I got into a big argument once with somebody on a trademark, and they told me that they owned it, and I said that I owned it, and we went in front of the trademark commission, and I hired an attorney. It was pretty basic, and my invoice predated their invoice. My registration for uh, so I forget what it was. It wasn't a domain name predated theirs because of the dates. I was able to secure and retain my mark. Now, one of the things about a mark is you can and let, let's. Um, I want to show you. Where is it? Oh, they've changed this. It's gotten so much better looking. It used to be an awful, awful, awful piece. Okay, so in any event, in order for you to get registered and actually own the mark, you have to go through a process and you have to secure your trademark. But in the meantime, you can put a little TM next to it and hold on to it and reserve the circle R for a later date. And what I would do is I would do circle R versus TM you can pretty much read anything. So common law, as you read here, and I'm showing you this because I don't want to be put in a position of practicing law. I'm just showing you what it shows on, on a Google search, uh, which is why I'm being cautious here. But the difference really is, is by putting the TM, you're basically claiming the mark. But until you actually get it registered and legal, that's when you use the registered mark or the circle R. Now, these are so important in what I do all day long that I've got shortcuts that automatically fill spaces with a TM or a circle R. We can talk about that also. Um, now, here's the big thing about a trademark. You ready? If you get one, it is your responsibility to protect it. So it comes with it. Now, I, I worked with a company that had a patent, same situation. It's even worse. With patents, you're basically disclosing what you're about to build, and you're giving away the formula to a certain degree of what it is you're, in fact, doing. And when you do that and somebody steals your idea or infringes upon it, you go off and you have to then deal with that. If you don't, if you ignore it, you could lose it. This happened with a coffee process with a company that I was with. And apparently, uh, countries throughout the world are taking their idea and, and using it. And they were constantly, constantly, constantly fighting their patent. Patents are not trademarks. It's a big difference. But just remember, and I have had to spend money on legal fees, where somebody was using my trademark 
in another country or another part of our country in a similar fashion. Now beware that just because they use your mark, if they're a hospital and you're a, a QuickBooks Pro Advisor, those things aren't necessarily related and it's probably okay. It's when another QuickBooks Pro Advisor uses your terminology that you've trademarked or been using for a reasonable amount of time is when you need to be concerned. So I go back to our presentation and I ask you the question that I asked earlier, should you even trademark in the first place? I personally, when it's not something very, very important, I will just add my TM, stake my claim and take my chances. By, by going out and registering it, I'm actually opening myself up. I choose in most cases not to. Now I have done it, but right now I'm not. Ignite program, for example, you can see Ignite method and 74 systems. They have their TMs on them. It's basically staking my claim but I have not registered them with a circle R. You can look more into that or contact your attorney if you wanna ask more questions. Same thing goes true with a copyright. It's a different type of thing. And then of course the, the bullet point for nothing is should you just do nothing? As long as you keep good records, here's the real clincher on this. And this is something that business owners often get stuck on. Is it really gonna hurt you if somebody uses your trademark? That's when you need to make the decision whether or not you're gonna spend money to protect it. Is it worth protecting? You have to make that decision. Okay, now let's take what we just learned there. We've got our entity type and we've got our trademarks in our mind and our brand, right? It all comes down to a brand. And at the end of the day, it's about what you're calling your company and how important today is a domain name. It's extremely important. It should have a story. It should be easy to remember. If you notice, I have 74systems.com, ignitemethod.com, unfamilycourt.com, astutome.com, schoolofbookkeeping.com. I have over 100 domain names. All my kids, Eric Greenspan, Jackson Greenspan. Uh, I've got, I just got Audrey's the other day. I mean, we, we have all those domain names stored. Now, it's beyond just a domain name, though. Every single social media network also has a domain set up for you. So for example, I'm facebook.com forward slash Eric Greenspan and twitter.com, my handle is Eric Greenspan and so on and so on and so on. Now there's a famous chef out there who's not very happy about that, but he hasn't offered me millions of dollars for them all, so he's not gonna get them. So what's in a name? Well, a lot, because you want to remember who you are and you wanna give your marketing staff, me, yourself, your team, whoever it is that's helping you grow your business, something to work with. If it's just your name, that's okay. But if it's not your name, which I prefer, give it something that has meaning. 74 Systems has tons of meaning. It is about the perfect temperature right here in the city of Santa Barbara, where I've been for the last 30 years and both of my children were born. That's important to me. It was started as 74 degrees. I've told this story before over and over. So I found a domain that fit and other domains that go along with it. Sadly, I don't own igniteprogram.com. I couldn't get it. <clears throat> You're gonna rack your brain trying to find the perfect company name, the perfect domain name that's also available on social media. How do we do it? Funny you should ask. Let's go do it. So we're gonna jump over here and I'm gonna to go to my favorite searching spot, which is GoDaddy and I'm not gonna log in, although it's probably got me cookie. And I'm just gonna pop up here in the box and I'm gonna type a name and it can be anything. So let's say I wanted to start a company today and I'm going to be um, gorillabookkeeping.com. Boom, I did not practice that. This has happened from time to time where you find the perfect name gorillabookkeeping.com. The story would be that you're either related to Tarzan, you grew up in the jungle, probably not, or that you help with the 400 pound gorilla, the monkey on their back. Oh, I could just go on and on. I, I, I did not practice any of this, but this is, 
This is, this is what gives us fodder to work with in marketing. The monkey on your back is, is your book's not in order. We can change that. If you want this domain, grab it. And if you want to run with this idea, grab it. It's a good one. Okay, so what I did is I searched gorillabookkeeping.com. And the fact that I see it's available is awesome. Well, I could also go to facebook.com and look for Gorilla Bookkeeping here. See if anybody has it. And lo and behold, this page, page isn't available, which generally should mean it's dead. It's not, it, it, it is available is what it really should mean. Because if you go to mine, it's going to bring you to my page. And there's me with my chubby baby. So Gorilla Bookkeeping, this part of the domain, needs to be available in the social network side of things. Now, once you find something or don't find something, now you start trimming it down. And let's focus only on .com. And let's start scrolling. All of these are longer than I want them to be. Gorillabet.com, if you were going to start a casino, could be okay. But everything looks too long here. So now I'm going to start shortening and create variations. And in this case, I'm going to do gorillabooks.com. And I'm going to search again. And this one's available. But notice because it got shorter and because somebody probably searched it once, somebody bought it and will sell it to you for $2,500. Should you buy it? Probably. If it was $24,000, probably not. It would be better if it was $488. It would be better if it was free or $829, which is my price. See, it's got a cookie. Uh, I pay $829 because I joined the, the domain club. But normally it would be $14.99 or $0.99 cents your first domain. But you also want to buy the variations of it. So if you're going to go back to Gorilla Bookkeeping, you probably want to also buy and, and look into Gorilla Accounting if you can call yourself an accountant. And look at that. It's taken. Let's see who that is. And it's actually a real firm. Gorilla Accounting in, it looks like somewhere in the UK, perhaps, Wales. England and Wales. Gorilla Accounting. So somebody got to my idea before me, but as you can see, now that would probably make me question whether or not I want to own Gorilla Bookkeeping. If I'm purely a bookkeeper and I never use the word accounting in my name, then it'd be fine. It wouldn't really make a difference. You can go with Gorilla Bookkeeping, which in this case is available. So this is the process you go through and you just keep going. And sometimes you start off with the craziest words and you end up with something that makes sense. Put in words of things that you do, that you love, favorite sports, favorite places to visit, favorite songs, favorite anything and blend them with your brand. Whoever came up with the most ridiculous name for a service ever, MailChimp, has created a brand that's so strong. The reason they created MailChimp is because mail.com was taken and chimp was simple and kind of funny and they built a brand around a silly little monkey. It became iconic. Gorillabooks.com would have been awesome. Gorillabookkeeping.com, it's not terrible, okay? Let's move on. So this part is determining a platform, and, and obviously we're talking about these two major pieces. And, and within these two major pieces, you're going to have to determine whether you want to go with QuickBooks Online, QuickBooks Desktop, both zero, mixture, with no desktop, zero. Do you want to learn point of sale? Do you want to become advanced certified? Now, folks, only 3% are advanced certified. If you spend a day and get advanced certified, you're pretty much guaranteed to get more business because you're going to be lifted up on the list on the ProAdvisor site alone, not to mention confidence. 
not to mention, and nobody knows it took you four times to get through it. And nobody knows that you went through a process, you know, by, by, by watching the videos on a student me to learn how to take a test. And nobody, everybody knows actually, and nobody cares because it's an open book test. They want you to pass it. The more people that pass it, the better for Intuit. Intuit has got the biggest coup going. They got you going to scaling new heights next week or soon. Uh, QuickBooks Connect, you go to ZeroCon for that. I mean, you go to these events and spend your own money so that you can sell more of their product. That's what it's all about. That's what they want. They want you to pass, but they also have to make it difficult so that it has value. Is advanced difficult? Well, if I can pass the regular class, you certainly should be able to pass advanced. And if you don't, so what? Try. Now, whether you're going for zero or into it is obviously a preference. Some of you are going to focus on zero. Usually people that focus on zero, they either dabble just a little bit because somebody asked them to, but your client doesn't really care. If you ask me to build you a logo, you're not, you don't care if I use Adobe Photoshop or Corel Draw. You just want an image that comes out in a proper format at the end. It doesn't matter what I use to create that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in the tools section. So you can define what in fact is the platform that you can use for your clients. You can tell me that you chose QuickBooks because you knew that myself, I'm talking about me specifically, would love to have an app in my hand that gives me an income statement and you know, P&L and, and balance sheet. And Zero doesn't do that. That could be one argument for why you did it. You could also do it because it's ubiquitous. It's a brand everybody knows. It's growing a lot. Who knows? You may choose Zero because of the sexy factor. It's new, it does things differently, it's fresh, it's, it's not spaghetti code that's been repaired over the years. You know, it's interesting, I, I wonder if it's just because it's hidden, but the Zero brand doesn't have its circle R. So you see their circle R's that, that on QuickBooks. It might be hidden down in here and it's black. They should fix that when you use this logo. I'll let them know. So determining your platform, don't get hung up on this. If zero is calling your name, go for it. If you're already in the Intuit space and that's where you're going and you're focused on that, great. If you're a desktop player, fabulous. Learn QBO, learn QBO. If you don't move in that direction at some part of your career, I would argue that you're making a big mistake because Intuit's putting all of its resources going into that direction and it opens up way more opportunity for you from a remote standpoint so that you can gain more business. All right, so let's talk about a website. So I call them websites that work. That's what we build. And the reason why is because they have to do something. A website is not just a landing page or a business card. It could be, but I don't see it that way. I see a website as something that is useful and actually helps your clients get closer to you and engage and interact with you. How do we do that? Well, we create systems around a website, a framework, but it has to start by telling the story and it has to tell the story as simple as possible so that they know who you are. So the first question you've got to address with your website is, what do you do? If it takes me this, to scroll down to the second page to learn what you do on your website, something's wrong. Now, if, if that scroll or the click through is because you're giving me the urge, because you're calling me through some sort of a technique or a tactic, that's okay. But in general, you want people to get to that information quickly. Now, if they have to click one time, you'll see on some of the sites we build, It'll say, want to know what we do or want to learn more, whatever it might be. Click here, and boom, you go to the next page and it's just a floodgate worth of information. You've got everything you need there. Okay. But I usually put a brief story on the very, very beginning page that says what we do in a nutshell. You don't want to lose people because they get to your website and they can't figure out what the heck you do. Okay. Keep that in mind. And remember, We've got to define what you do. If you're a website customer with us or a hosting customer with us, you've just recently been sent a beautiful link that we built in a wonderful website tool that extracts information from you. It forces you to fill in blanks that are magnificent. 
And then all of that automatically gets stored into your Insightly profile in the CRM, which makes my job super easy because everything is all there containerized and ready to go to help build you a site that actually is gonna tell the proper story. And then the other part of it is differentiation. Now I know that's hard in, in if you're a QuickBooks Pro Advisor, you're a QuickBooks Pro Advisor, but Gorilla Bookkeeping kind of gets the job done. So does Slam Dunk Accounting. Another client, right? Kickbooks, one of my favorites. Great books, stable books. We've got all these cool little renditions of QuickBooks type accounting and bookkeeping professionals tied up into a cool little brand. What is your brand? What does it say about you? Do you do anything different? I, I won't speak to who it is or what it is, but there's somebody on this session right now who does something very unique from the rest of you. And that process and that, that product that this person provides creates tremendous value for the customers, but it also creates tremendous income for this person. Now, the big problem is, is trying to tell the story of what it is and get people's attention to accentuate the differences and, and the offering is challenging for, for even for me. And we're working on that. We just got started and we'll nail it. But you need to make sure you do. If you've got something that's different, Make sure you tell the story of why and leverage the difference so that people will be appealed to work with you. That's how I get business. People are appealed to work with us because we offer extreme customer service. We're state of the art. We're, we're totally into automation and technology. We work with accountants and bookkeepers and business owners. That's our specialty. We've got a tremendous amount of experience and we've got all these pieces in the, in the mix, right? And ABO and Astutomy and 74 Systems and Ignite Program and Ignite Method. You've got to create that community for yourself. I had a chat with one of you this morning who said a very nice thing. You said that our brand is, is out there. It's everywhere. You see it in all the different figures of the community. And that's in, in so many words, what we've talked about. And, and that's exactly what we've been working hard to create for ourselves because we don't wanna be the shoemaker's child that wears torn up shoes. We wanna have gorgeous loafers. And then you've gotta really make it easy for them to communicate with you. If you work with us, you know, we always slam a schedule form right onto your website in many, many different places. Everybody that generally does business with us usually starts off with one of those forms. Now, Ignite Method is new. It's the first of the bunch where people would just buy it and try it and pay for it and sign up without doing a, a, a free consultation, which was strange. That's why I pulled the plug on, on last two weeks because I wanted to make sure I got the free consultation because I expected that would happen and it didn't. With Ignite program, it always does. And, and websites, most of the time, unless you already know us. So giving them the ability to communicate with you, whether that's through a quick form or through a scheduling piece of software that auto schedules for you, not only is going to take the burden off of your office operations, but it's also gonna give them easy access to your calendar and get more people signed up with you. And they're super easy to use today. And we're gonna to talk a little bit about the ones that we prefer in just a bit. And then at the end of the day, one of the things that I love, just this morning, I wrote a little script using Automator on the Mac, just a little macro thing, that whenever I hit a certain set of keys on my laptop, I haven't added it to my, my Mac Pro here yet, but when I do it on my MacBook Pro, whenever I hit, uh, I set it up to go option, arrow left. So option, arrow key, left, arrow key. And what that would allow me to do is open up a finder window or in your world, the, the uh, Windows Explorer, the file manager, if you will, because we always need that, you know? And I'm constantly scrolling down, clicking, bringing it up, relocating it. Why, why shouldn't I have a click, click, and there it is. So I automated that process. I also subscribed to a tool this morning called Text Expander. I don't know if they make it for PC but it's wonderful on the Mac, and I'm sure there's plenty of them out there for PC. But the, the, the idea is to find a product that will automatically fill stuff. So the Mac has it built in, but I wanted more features like you do. So I found a tool that would allow me to type the beginning of my password that I always mistype 
for all of the things that I use, the, the different variations. And based on what I type, it'll even fill in the password for me, which is going to save me 20 minutes a day. Saving of time and automating processes is huge. Doing it on your website, like when you fill in a client form for us, and that gets populated automatically into Insightly, emails get sent out and tasks get created. That takes place of a certain amount of FTE and employee, staff, or your time so that you can focus on production or sales. So this one usually becomes quite a point of contention in Ignite. And I know that, you know, when, when I did the webinar, it's a very popular webinar we did, uh, Facebook is more than babies and burritos. And the, the metaphor there is that while we post about our personal lives, it's great, but why would I want to share that with somebody? Well, I mean, I can pretty much guarantee you that one of you knows me because of something I posted about one of my kids and you grew connected to me because I shared something that was appealing to you. And I'm not going to say I'm doing it on purpose because I really don't. I love it. I think it's fun to, to share something about like we took a hike this weekend and I made this cool little Apple Clips video on your iPhone. They've got this cool little Clips video that they, uh, app that they just came out with. I love this thing. And so I took some of the pictures and I started creating this little video from it. And you can put sound on it and you can add all these little elements. And I threw that up on Instagram and shared it to Twitter and to Facebook all at one time. And I love hearing what people have to say and they comment about how beautiful my children are. Some woman who I don't know said something along the lines of, I love watching your children grow up, which means I've lifted her a little bit. Can she become a client someday? Perhaps a lot of people do. She could become a friend. Who knows what might happen in that regard? A long, long time ago when Jackson was first born, somebody on Twitter who I met only on Twitter asked me, and it was a little weird at first, but she said, what's your mailing address? Don't give me your home, give me your mailing address. I have a gift for you. Well, she turns out she knits blankets. So she sent me this beautiful blanket that said Jackson's name on it. Did I think at the time that that was a little awkward? I did, but did I, she was part nice and part smart, both parts equally probably. But the point I'm making to you is she did this because I went and shared this blanket and it created commotion on Twitter and she sells them in her Etsy shop. Kind of genius to see somebody who was prominent at the time on Twitter with a blanket who just had a baby and is getting a lot of press and so on and so It makes sense. But I'm not sure she did it for that reason. That's the problem with all this social media is that we kind of go both ways with it, right? Sometimes we, we really just want to share our story and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we force it. When you force it, it doesn't come across well. I haven't done a, a Radio Ignite episode in a little bit. And part of the reason is is because at the end of the day, uh, I haven't really felt the mojo in me to, to share those ideas. So I've been focused on other things. That's the beauty of our service is we have lots of different variables. And right now I didn't feel that it was worth me being on camera for you to listen to what we're talking about. So I stayed off of camera, not to mention, as I said earlier, we were up all night with kids that would not go to sleep. So that's the option we have. Social media allows us to do different things. Sometimes it's video, sometimes it's audio, sometimes it's just a snapshot, and sometimes it's just text. Often it's just text. So let me just take you through a few things on social media that you need to conquer, okay? The first one is you need a standardized logo and photo. And if you've seen me on Facebook, you will see, if you go to twitter.com, Eric Greenspan, you will see my picture on Twitter is this picture here of me. And this is my, uh, one of my, I have three pictures from Ted where I'm standing on the stage and it's a cool picture, you know? And this is us putting together our booth at AccountX. Silly background. It's not standardized. I actually changed those. I'm gonna talk about standardizing, but this is. You know me from this picture. I sometimes change it. During Mother's Day, I put a picture of my mom kissing my cheek. During Father's Day, I put a picture of my dad's penny loafers that I took when he died. We went to um, sort of his wake, so to speak, and, and we each took something out of his 
uh, closet because he was a clothes horse and he was big on penny loafers. So I put on his penny loafers and I took a pictures, picture of my shoes and I put that up to, to remember my father on Father's Day or his birthday. But generally, you're going to see this picture of me here. And it doesn't matter really where you go. If you go to Facebook, which is, of course, going to jump to Abo, But if I go back to me, you're going to see right now I've got this picture, which is me and, the, and two of the kids. But I generally will switch back to the other. So I go to update my profile picture. And you're going to see that that picture is going to be found in my pictures. Here's my pictures of me. They keep changing the way they do this. But I guarantee you. Yeah, of course, it's not going to happen right now. If I go to photos and go to albums and go to, oh, it's featured photos now. I said, okay. So there it is. And you can see I've used it with overlays for account X. And when the Lakers were in the playoffs, here's the one I used before, but I don't use anymore. When I have a great picture, there's mom and I, right? Mother's Day. Buckeyes are playing. This one sometimes goes up. The beautiful woman. In my life, I put that up from time to time, but I generally will go back to this photo and make that my profile picture because then it allows me to be standardized everywhere throughout social media so you get to remember me by that picture. There it is again, there it is again, and I could show it to you on and on and on and on. So standardizing your logo or your photo. Now I say logo because if you're going to do a business account, then you want to have a logo. And you want these generally for the main profile photo, you want them square. You want one transparent and one with a white or black background or whatever color of your choice. Transparent sometimes is important and, and we can go into that. Uh, there's a number, actually, there's a, a webinar we did and one that's coming up on a Studemy about cover images that you should check out. Okay, and then the cover image itself, which is the image up above, you know, if we go and we look again at Abo, for example, when I open up Facebook, it goes straight to Abo. So these are all standardized images. Each day we put up a different one. Tomorrow I'll put up mine and on Wednesday we put up Lynn Matice. But they're all the same. We change them from time to time, but this is the latest rendition. Facebook kind of messes with your colors. It's hard to get it perfect. I've gotten as close as I can this time. But this is Carrie's day on Abo, and this is a standard image, and they just moved this part away from the bottom where all this stuff used to lay upon, and we got to change the size of this image. Now, these images all have sizes, and you need to figure out what those are. You can go to 74 Systems, and you can find it on our blog because we wrote a recent, here's the how to make a proper feature image, but we were recently wrote, you know what, sorry, that was on a Studemy. So if you go to Too Legit to Audit on a Studemy, you'll find Social Media Image Sizes 2017, I'll put that into chat for you. And this will take you through the list of the different sizes. Now, I believe this cover photo has just changed in size. Um, we'll be updating that shortly. But, and they change, but you need to get those sizes right. This is from SoundCloud, and it's a square, and it likes 1,000 by 1,000 pixels, very high resolution. You need to know these kinds of things. You can see back here the different dimensions from this. I was trying to show that through because this is typical what you're going to see on like YouTube or Google Plus. But if you put it on a full screen television, it would scale all the way up to 2K, which is 2560 by 1440. I know that's a lot of stuff to think about, but you can hire a graphic designer or we can help you with that. But just know and understand that it's important to make sure you know the sizes so they look good and make sure they're mobile friendly. Notice that this welcome to Abo thing that's in the middle, it's like this for a reason because this is the part that will show up on your mobile device. Carrie won't be seen and this part won't be seen, but this middle part will and it'll look proper in most cases. And then your bio. 
what you say about yourself. Again, if you, you know, I, I have a short version of it and I have a long version of it, but if you go to my Twitter account, you'll generally see this. Tenacious father, ferocious entrepreneur, marketing marvel. Huh, pretty funny. Isn't that the same bio I used when, we, when I showed you my uh, vanity slide for the beginning of today's presentation? Yes, it is, because I use a consistent one. I've got a longer version and a short version. And if you, again, you're a client of ours and we build a website or we're hosting for you, you know you've already filled this out that you've got a short bio and a long bio. We're helping you build that for yourself, okay? And so write your bio. And then a standardized name. Uh, once you come up with your brand, you're gonna find that some of your social media handles are gone. A Studemy is there. Uh, when I first started, I don't think it, well, of course it was. School of Bookkeeping was not. We ended up with School of Books. So there, there, you have to make sure that you can use it to the best of your ability. Um, if for some reason you can't get one of them, you may be able to alter it with one letter or something. But ideally, you want to get every single extension, facebook.com forward slash Eric Greenspan, facebook.com forward slash 74 systems or Ignite Method or Ignite Program. You want that forward slash to be the same on all of the networks. Let's talk quickly about Facebook itself. First of all, there's you, which is your wall. Then there's your business pages and there's your groups. We talk a lot about this, so I'm not gonna go into detail, but you need all three. A page is a license to spam. Anybody that likes your page is gonna see whatever you post there and you can post whatever the heck you want there. Make sure you post links to your sites. Make sure you post links to a sign-up form. You can even sell stuff directly there or schedule stuff directly there. There's all kinds of cool features in pages now. You is just you, of course. That's just the stuff you talk about, babies and burritos. I don't post a lot of business stuff in my you section, in my feed, in my personal feed. I usually reserve that for my page, and periodically I drop stuff into ABO, which is my group. You don't want to drop stuff into somebody else's group. They're going to kick you out. Twitter, you got the same thing. We've got forward slash Eric Greenspan, and you got forward slash 74 systems and a variety of others. Now, let me explain something to you. Twitter is almost always going to be one or the other. And generally, you. People are typically found on Twitter and followed, you know, whether you're Ashton Kutcher or, or somebody along those lines. I remember he was the biggest one. Uh, people that are famous, obviously, are going to get more play. But the Gary Vaynerchuks of the world and the Jeff Pulvers, these are people that are, you know, uh, the Twitterati, so to speak. Um, it's their name. My Twitter handle for Eric Greenspan has uh, over 20,000 followers. 74 Systems has less than 1,000. So keep that in mind. Pick one and go with it, but use both. Google Plus, same kind of a thing. I always make the joke that nobody pays attention to Google Plus, but the more you post your Google Plus pages, the better it is because Google owns Google Plus, and if Google owns search and SEO is tied to search, and SEO and Google and Google Plus are all under the same roof. Get it? You want to make sure you post there as well. LinkedIn, yeah, you're going to get a different audience. It's important, particularly from a business perspective. People have built an entire audience on LinkedIn. You can use it much like Facebook groups and pages. You can use LinkedIn in the same capacity. You're probably not going to get the same kind of interaction engagement that you will in Facebook. Uh, or Instagram, and for sure, for sure, Snapchat. But uh, it's definitely a professional level discussion group opportunity, and you should be posting there as well. Should you use Instagram and Pinterest and Snapchat and all these other ones? Instagram, I argue, yes. I have an automated zap that every time I post to Instagram, it copies it to Pinterest, just so I'm there. Uh, I don't use Snapchat. I've tried it. it scares me. It's for kids, in my opinion. It's probably great, and there's a lot of things we can use it, but there's no way I'm going to convince a group of bookkeeping and accounting professionals to use Snapchat, so I skip that. Instagram's great, though. You can share images and videos, and you can share them to Facebook and Twitter with one fell swoop. Kind of cool. All right, so the tools are the web, and this is for social media. You can log in, just like I showed you just a moment ago, with your group through the web. 
there's apps. Almost every uh, one of these has a mobile app, has a computer app, whether it's Mac or PC. Uh, there's third-party apps. There's all kinds of things. A great example of a third-party app is Hootsuite. You can post and read to all of the different social media networks with Hootsuite. Um, there's a number of these uh, that you can use. Hootsuite seems to be the easiest. One of my favorites when working with a WordPress website, and you don't have to have a WordPress website, but I do love it for this purpose is CoSchedule. It's a little pricey, but it's worth every nickel because not only does it allow you to schedule all of your content through a beautiful calendar interface that's very simple and share it to every single social network you have, but it also automatically requeues everything. And if you ever see something that we posted and you think, wait, I think I've seen that before. You probably don't remember seeing it before. And that's the, the, the beautiful thing about social media is you can reuse your content and CoSchedule will do that for you. So if you have an off day or you're super busy or you didn't get a chance to schedule, this thing will schedule for you and keep requeuing things throughout a period of time so that you never have any dead content. That is an extra set of hands. Okay, so here are the basic must do's with social media. Have a presence on one or all. If there's one, pick one and go for it. Try to be everywhere, but at least Facebook, Twitter, share to Google Plus, set it up just to share to it, just to get it out there so that there may be a chance of some SEO yumminess. YouTube is great. I just got a deposit for uh, AdSense from people watching our videos on YouTube for free. They watch a quick ad and I get paid for that. Um, LinkedIn, whatever. But, but if you find one that you're more prone to like and understand, feel free to jump into that one and learn it and use all of its pieces. If it's Facebook, make sure you're focused on your own sharing of yourself to whatever limits you feel comfortable with, but try to push those. As I talked earlier, that can bring engagement. Build your page, manage your page, make it pretty, make sure your cover photos and your, 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 your logos and your images, profile photos are up to date. Uh, plenty of people, including myself, my pictures from 2011 are running a picture that's from when they were a bit younger. Um, I've got some pictures that I'm proud of today but I haven't been on the TED stage since. So I love that picture and it's kind of become my meme. Next, when, when you are out there, you wanna make sure you are sharing everywhere and as often as possible. And what I mean by this sentence or statement is, if you're gonna share, share. Don't just drop a little link here and there, make the effort to share as often as possible or in as many places as possible using a tool like Hootsuite or CoSchedule so that you can get a number of uh, posts that will be shared at the same time. I have a quick question. Some advise not to post the same material to multiple sites because most people follow you in more than one place. So they get pissed off. Thoughts? It's social media. I mean, you can set it for, for different periods but I'm going to share, I personally share in different places. If you're gonna find it on Twitter, maybe one day and maybe another day in Facebook. Most people aren't following you that closely in different uh, areas that they're gonna mind. And if they don't like, and if they're following you on multiple sites, who cares? They're probably appreciating the fact that you made it easier for them to find it. Uh, don't worry about pissing people off by sharing. If you piss people off because you're, you're saying things about, well, I always avoid religion and politics and, um, and, and, and I don't rant. I always have a positive attitude when I'm on social media. Sometimes I use Twitter to let a company know when I'm dissatisfied. That's the only time, and that's common. But I honestly believe that you need to share wherever you possibly can. But again, going back to what I said earlier, do pick a focus. I'm really more focused on Facebook than anything else, but I do drop my shares into Twitter and other places. And quite frankly, I find completely different people either uh, resharing, uh, liking, uh, marking, whatever it is. And sometimes it's the same people. And if it's the same people, it's because they're stalking me and they're not going to mind. So that's how I feel about it. 
Okay, so share when you're sharing. Go for it. Do it. Take advantage of the opportunity. You only have so much time. And when somebody responds to you, you've got to respond back. When somebody engages with you, you've got to engage back. That's very important. If you ignore people when you tweet something and they say, wow, that was really great. You know, a lot of Twitter is about thank you for the retweet and that kind of stuff. And that's good. But when somebody asks you a question and they say, hey, I'm interested and you ignore them because you're not following your Twitter after you've shared to it, that is a shame. Mostly because that person's probably going to lose interest. And secondly, because you had a fish on and you didn't reel them in. And that's the purpose for using a lot of this stuff is to build relationships and grow your business. And be present. Human. Social media is social. That's the key. There's human beings out there that you're talking to, that you're engaging with. If somebody's pissed off because you're oversharing, address it. Talk to them. Find out what's going on. There are certain times to avoid people on social media. People will say the darnest things or they'll behave inappropriately. Goodbye. Block them. That's the beauty of social media. Anybody who's not providing you with comfort or a reasonable approach, click block. You're gone. Okay, we are out of time, but I'm going to quickly get through. I was going to go an hour today, but I want to quickly get through this one. This one's easy. So do you work from an office or your home? And I'm going to talk about the benefits of both quickly. So the office is nice. It has overhead. So that's not necessarily a benefit. It does allow you to focus. Although I find focusing at home works actually better. You just have to learn how to do it. One of the biggest challenges, and I'll sum it up for you, working from home versus an office is either having space for you to work. And those of you that know me, sometimes I'm in my office, which I'm completely separated from the rest, or sometimes I'm sitting in the middle of my den and my kids are roaming around. But I know how to shut them off. I can put on headphones or not. And I make sure that my clients know and understand I'm working from home and they're okay with that. And if they're not, then goodbye. If you don't understand that I work from home and I prefer, look, I've had $22,000 a month uh, uh, rental or lease payments for a giant space. That was one building. Then we had another building. We're talking about tens of thousands of square footage. I don't want that right now in my career. It doesn't make sense for my business. And because your business is like my business from a service perspective, you can work from home. Now, once you start gaining employees, it becomes a problem. If you don't want employees in your house or you don't have a separate area, then you probably should look into office space. But I should mention this. Make your office space as close as possible so it's easy. Don't make it frustrating to go to work unless you like a long drive to digest what happened or call clients or your family. But generally, being able to scoot back and forth from your office to your home if you have an office is preferred. All right, tools. We're going to finish on this and then we're done. So I'm going to start off with things like the Mac or a PC, and I'm not going to make an argument for either one. I just want you to consider the device, whether, and this is a metaphor, whether it's a Mac or a PC, a Lenovo or a Toshiba or an HP or whatever it might be, find something you know, find something you like, find something you can afford, spend a little more than you should, buy the better of the two. Generally, when you buy a computer and you buy the faster model, it's going to last longer and resell better. Trust me, I know this from experience. I've always bought at the very top. I've always used it further than most people would get out of a computer and still have tremendous amount of performance. And when I sold it, I was able to get the top dollar for that particular product. If I sold it, I handed down my very high level, very expensive MacBook Pro to my daughter who can use that machine for the next four or five years, no problem, because it's still faster than a lot of the models you'd buy today. So don't necessarily concern yourself Mac or PC. Now, if you really want to know what I think about Mac versus PC, Mac all the way, because you can run everything on a Mac, you can run on a PC, and in most cases, better. With a product like Parallels, you can literally run every single Windows version you want with one click. You can run apps natively. It's beautiful. Do I do it? Not very often, because almost everything runs on the Mac. But 
in your world, with the exception of QBO and Zero, if you're running desktop or those types of pieces, you're going to need to have Windows. If you're running Windows and you don't ever have the need for a Mac and you're just not interested, then find a PC you love that's reliable, that you like the way it feels, its keyboard and, and its support. I was a huge ThinkPad fan uh, as I was coming up in the world and I worked for IBM and I had one of the very first laptops they ever made and I bought ThinkPad after ThinkPad. I created my first company on a ThinkPad 700C. It was an amazing product. Today, it's such a antiquated box, but it's still, they're always top of the line. One of the things I loved about it was the way the keyboard worked. So some of you will go back and forth on this. I have both. I use Gmail from G Suite, which is the paid version. And I have Office 365 and I have several accounts in either one and different iterations. So there's Office 365 that comes with just online. There's Office 365 that allows you to download the apps. Clearly downloading the apps should be a no brainer for everybody. But if you go to the home version and you can download the apps, then you can't use the exchange features of domain-based email. Domain-based email is very, very important. Eric at 74systems.com versus Eric Greenspan at gmail.com. They're both email addresses, but one is personal and one is business. And if you're not using your business name, in your URL, you're hurting yourself because nobody is able to find you by looking at your domain and going off and finding at gmail.com, at hotmail.com, doesn't tell them anything. But 74systems.com says, oh, that's where I can find their website so I can engage, interact, and possibly hire these people. So whether you use one or the other really doesn't matter these days, but I will tell you that in the cloud, Google seems to be the better piece of um, connected software in the cloud. Office 365 is Microsoft's version of the cloud coming from old school exchange servers and, and different ways of doing things and tied to Outlook and that type of thing. If you are gung-ho about Outlook and you have no desire to change, go with Office 365, use Outlook, you'll be just fine. If you really need interoperability with a lot of the apps out there and you're into the technology and you want to be really flowing with the variety of different things, use Google's G Suite. And believe it or not, for those of you, and I don't even do this, but those of you that are cutting edge like me, if you wanted to use both at the same time, there's actually a way to do that. If anybody has that interest, which I doubt you do, let me know. Real quickly, I love Safari because it's Mac. But Chrome is by far the one browser that seems to work over every single device. And you can log in and save everything from device, 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 device. Chrome will work better for just about anything. Firefox is kind of fading away. If you're still using it, fine. If it works, great. But if it doesn't, it's time to switch to Chrome or at least have Chrome. I'm sure all of you have Chrome on your system. It's pointless to talk about. But if Internet Explorer is giving you a hard time, or if Safari is giving you a hard time, and certainly if Firefox is, Chrome is going to be where most developers focus their energy because they know that most people have it. It's accessible on every platform and it's maintained by one of the biggest companies in the world. The Logitech 920 is by far still the best webcam. They're under 60 bucks. There are better models. I have the 4K one. There's the 930. There's the 923 or something. But honestly, I've got a ton of these. The 920 is still the one I use. It still works the best. No question about it. Mice, absolutely personal preference. Keyboards, I like solid keyboards. I like keyboards that allow me to do my work quickly. You're going to need 10 keys and other types of things like that. Take the time and test different ones and find something you like. Take the time and make your office space better. Productivity can be enhanced by simply replacing your keyboard. And then finally, microphones. Honestly, folks, anything from Blue Microphone that I've ever bought is absolutely extraordinary. So you can start with base models and work your way up. The one thing about a microphone you wanna make sure that you have is you wanna make sure it's not on the desk so that when you're popping the desk like this, 
That's me hitting the desk. Now you don't necessarily hear the thump through the microphone that you would uh, when the microphone is actually sitting on the desk. My microphone is hung above me and it has a pop filter over top of it. For those of you that know, you've seen it, it's red uh, and it's a blue, uh, blue microphone. It is the Yeti Professional. It is by far the greatest thing I've ever owned. You can record on it, uh, it's wonderful. I also recently bought the Raspberry, which allows you to connect to uh, Android, iPhone, and mobile devices and gives you the same quality. It's really an amazing device. Uh, you can live with one. If you're gonna live with just one and you wanna have all of it, Raspberry from Blue is an amazing product. Okay. And, oh, sorry, one more. We'll get through it real quick. So on the app side, just be careful to avoid app overload. You're gonna test new apps and you could go on and on and on. One of my favorite expressions, if you remember anything I've talked about today is the best app or the best piece of software is the one you actually use. When you use an app, if you realize you're not actually using it or it's not fitting your needs, replace it, consider replacing it, or enhance it. You can do a lot of cool things with apps to make them better. Insightly is not perfect, but when you add Pandadoc and Zapier and some of the other hooks, it is remarkable. And they, my favorite apps, as you've probably heard, for embedded scheduling or not, you can use it offline through their site as well with a link. Acuity scheduling is my favorite. Because of the last one, Zoom, Acuity will automatically integrate with Zoom, book your Zoom session, and when you cancel or change it, it will change it for you. So when you book with me, Acuity automatically finds the availability on my calendar, allows you to book that appointment based on the availability, schedules the Zoom session automatically, informs both of us automatically, puts it on the calendar, and then if any changes are made or if it's, it's canceled, it handles that as well. It's like a full-time employee. Acuity and Zoom together, absolutely, by far, I have found nothing that comes close. I like Schedule Once, but they don't have an integration with Zoom, only with the other two, uh, WebEx and GoToMeeting, which is, doesn't hold a candle to Zoom. And Sightly, as you know, I'm a big fan. I love it as a flat platform to be able to build on top of. It allows you to do a lot of things with it as, as the base, simplified, very robust, fast searching, infrastructure of a great system. And we can help you set that up or you can go for it yourself. I love that product, I really do. It's not perfect. Lucidchart is one of my favorites. I don't talk about it a lot, but whenever, and I don't use it a lot, but when I do use it, whenever I lay out a marketing plan or I wanna sketch something out or ideas, it's just, it's basically like a whiteboard on the, on the, on the web and I pay for it annually and I have one license and I literally love this product. Um, if you're working with me, you've probably seen your marketing plan and your marketing plan, and you will see me build a marketing plan using Lucidchart in an upcoming module. And then no question, MailChimp uh, is the most ubiquitous platform for email with automation and integrations with commerce and things like that. It's not the only one out there, but it does a really good job. And learning more than one I have found is very difficult to do because they change and you need to keep focused on something that's going to grow with the industry and stay a part of the cloud ecosphere that's continuing to expand. And finally, uh, we already talked about Zoom. You know how I feel about Zoom, we're using it right now. But finally, Zapier is my toy box and it is the most useful and the most amazing piece of, of web-based software I've ever used. I automatically have all of the invoices and sales receipts posted to QuickBooks online from WooCommerce through Insightly to MailChimp. Everything happens automatically. When you book an appointment with me, it goes through Acuity, it creates the Zoom session. It then creates automatically something in Insightly, that's part of Zapier, and then it'll add you to a MailChimp list. It might send another email, it might do a variety of different things. Zapier allows you to automate workflow and it's super simple to use and it's this simple, okay? It's this simple. Let me actually show you real quickly. I just created one yesterday that I love. Here's my zap that I created and it is 
right here. And what this zap does is this zap allows me to, when you go to this page on my website, which is restricted, it's gonna make me log in, isn't it? Nope, I'm logged in. So this is our client website set up in migration form that we just created. Now this is a form that's embedded on our website that works. And you are to answer these questions and those will automatically get added into your Insightly record in custom fields. Well, check this out. When I click on this, it's going to add additional things at the bottom. If I click here, it's gonna continue adding more and it's gonna continue adding more. But if you don't have these and you don't check these boxes, these things will disappear. Well, that's gravity forms in action on WordPress. But what's awesome about that is once you fill that out, then this zap says, okay, based on a trigger, you just filled out a form. That's it. It's connected to that piece of software and it says, somebody just submitted a form. When that happens, I want you to search in Sightly for the email address that that was submitted under. And if and only if you find that person, I want you to update that contact record. That is about the coolest thing I've ever seen. Now this is new, being able to update a contact in Insightly is a new feature within a Zap and it has changed everything for us because now we can send out anything to a, to a client base or to anybody and say, hey, can you please complete this information, crowdsource that and make sure that the data is properly implemented because it's gonna go directly from your keyboard into our records. That is one of my favorite things. I also have Zaps that automatically create a new customer from my WooCommerce system on Ignite Method or 74 systems into QBO. And every time I mark it completed, which is versus processing, that's how they do it in WooCommerce. As soon as I touch completed, it will add a sales receipt for your order inside of QBO. Whenever I tell this person here from Amazon, I don't wanna say her name because she'll respond, uh, to add a task to my Insightly, she will go ahead and do that because this app will do it and so on and so forth, okay? So that is the final app and that concludes today's module two, Taking the Leap. Your homework will be posted or emailed. Don't worry about it now, we're not gonna talk about it. And next, we will, as promised, and I will let you know, next week is Memorial Weekend and I'm not gonna do it on Monday. I've got a kids event and nobody probably show up anyhow. So I will let you know as soon as we're going to do this. And this will be the Ignite Marketing Plan where we will actually build a marketing plan that you will get a generic copy of that you can use and modify for your own benefit. Thank you very much for joining us today. That was Ignite Method Module Two. We look forward to seeing you in Module Three.